Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, we are going to take a few minutes to let other folks frozen. who have signed up join. You're frozen? The numbers are going on. So there, there are people Hello, here. Man. Okay, here we go. You guys froze up on me, sorry. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, the people are clicking up. So I think we'll give them like five minutes before we actually start. Uh, my name is Sarah Crawford. I work at the college. Uh, we are going to do our naloxone training. I'm going to wait to introduce Mark till we hopefully have more people here. Um, but yeah, welcome everyone. We're happy to see you here. We're going to get started at about 1035 for the actual training. Um, but if anyone has any questions while we're getting started, post them in the chat. Uh, we have the Q&A function. So we're hoping that you can use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, you can put some stuff in the chat, but uh, if you can put them in the Q&A, the actual questions. But uh, Sam, our events support, has asked everyone questions, how they're doing today. Um, if folks have any questions, just put them in. If there's anything you're worried about or want to know. Um, so this is considered a webinar. So we can, uh, you can all see us, but we can't see you. Um, that way it keeps confidential and yeah, no problem. We don't have to mute anyone. So um, it's just easier for us to run them as webinars. So, um, so far we've, we've got some folks here. We're going to wait a few more minutes, but, um, oh, you can't see or hear us. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we can't see or hear you. No, I was like, sorry, I misread Sam's post. Everyone can hear us. We are fine. Um, yeah, so if you want to ask a question though, uh, if you pop it in the Q and A, you can ask your question there. Uh, we can read it out. Or if you had something you wanted to ask live, then uh, we could always unmute you to ask your questions. So uh, if there is something you want to know for Mark, Mark's gonna be going through his presentation. Today, I will be monitoring the chat and seeing uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll ask them to Mark. Um, so that he can keep going with his presentation. So we're going to give it a couple more minutes. We're still getting a few people in here, but I am going to introduce Mark. Uh, Mark Barnes is our amazing pharmacist. He works for uh, Respect RX Pharmacy. Uh, they are a fantastic organization that he's going to tell you all about, but he also runs this amazing thing called naloxonecare.com. And it's all about providing uh, people across Ontario and other parts of Canada with uh, naloxone kits. So we thank Mark for coming. We are so happy that he's here. Mark is one of my besties and we work together all the time to provide you uh, some training. Mark is also the best pharmacist we could find because he's the most entertaining. So I promise you the next 30 to 45 minutes are gonna be filled with joy, a couple laughs, um, and you're gonna learn some fantastic stuff that's ultimately gonna help us save lives. So. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for having me again, sir. Um, and I, I guess I miss being on campus over there. So hopefully after Christmas, fingers crossed, we keep saying that, that, that we'll I be know. Well, January has been our date since like forever. I so, know, I know. Okay, so, so we're hoping. Yeah. My name is Mark Barnes. I'm a pharmacist and the owner of Respect Rx Pharmacy. Thanks for having me. So we have five Eastern Ontario locations, um, you know, really close to actually all, all wrapped around Algonquin, but we have one in Bell's Corners. Uh, we have one again in the Byward Market downtown, Vanier. We have Ottawa South and we have one over in Cornwall as well. So I'm an addiction treatment specialist. It's what I do. Okay. So I am an addiction pharmacist. So I'm not that guy with the white coat on a shopper's drug market that doesn't talk to you when you walk in there. That's not who I am. That was who he was, I guess, at one point. But now I'm an addiction treatment specialist pharmacist. So that is why I'm here today to talk to you guys about opiate overdose prevention and naloxone. First of all, I can't think of a better population to speak to. Uh, not only of your age, but necessarily probably your fact, your, your profession to be, you will probably come across someone in Ontario or across Canada uh, and experience someone in an acute opioid overdose. This is relevant first aid training. This is really almost as important as CPR training right now uh, with our opioid crisis that's happening. Um, so our company itself started in 2013 and it started at a necessity, okay? Now we have access to about 3,000 people who are battling addiction every single day, okay? Um, so that gives you access. That gives you access to real time. As of like this morning, I'm in our treatment center in Vanier. So it actually gives you real time um, exposure to what the opioid crisis is as of today, September 9th, 2021. What does that look like? 
further to this, I do work on a bunch of task force in the province and federal with the federal government. I'm on the overdose task force at the city of Ottawa since its inception about 12 years ago. So my job is to keep people safe. And how that started was with students, university students during escapade. Uh, about 11 or 12 years ago, there was a mass overdose at a festival and we freaked out and we didn't know how the hell to prevent this in the future. So we started a task force of like-minded individuals to try to prevent this. So I'm on that task force since, uh, since forever. Now I've joined one in Eastern Ontario health unit, as well as Leonard County. I also work in Kingston doing the same stuff. So really I have all kinds of information about the drug supply in Eastern Ontario, about kind of what's happening. So I wanna give that information to you guys. Now, my story is personal as well. In 2012, I gave out a fentanyl opioid pain patch to a dying cancer patient. Uh, that dying cancer patient sold it to a 19 year old in our community in Manitou who overdosed and died. At that point, uh, I felt to myself, wow, personally responsible, first of all, and second of all, saying if I can't trust a dying cancer patient with pain medication, then who can we trust, right? So that led, led to the fentanyl patch or patch return program, which is now Ontario law, adopted by the College of Physicians and Surgeons and Pharmacists and the other Chiefs of Police. But also, it made me start thinking about, I want to do this full time. And that's what led to Respect Our Ex-Pharmacy. Why do we call it Respect? Because respect is the biggest thing missing in addiction treatment and dealing with people with complex mental health. This past 18 months has sucked. It has been the worst 18 months we have seen in our life and probably will be the worst we've seen, we will see in our lifetime. We have been through the wars. People are struggling at all levels. Even when I speak to counselors uh, at university campuses across the country, um, they're overworked. It's not just seniors and and, and kids, it's actually all, all ages are struggling with their own personal mental health, trying to deal with self-isolation and fear and anxiety. So we know we have these problems and you know what, there is services at Algonquin College that can help students, um, but also going to trainings like this, learning how you can help someone is so, so important. But we need to have respect for our clients who are battling right now because addiction is through the roof. We'll talk about that as we go along in the presentation. I am such a supporter of Algonquin College and people who are battling and struggling with mental health that we actually formed, this is how much of a partner Algonquin I am and how much I love that, the college, is that we have formed uh, uh, a gift actually for Algonquin students. And it's the Respect Our Ex-Pharmacy Perseverance Bursary. So one student at Algonquin College um, will receive a $2,500 cash uh, grant for education. And some of the criteria, it's not that he had the best marks because this guy didn't, it's not because you are like top of the class and doing everything because this guy didn't. What it is actually is somebody who's actually battled addiction or complex mental health to be a successful student in Algonquin. That's the criteria. It's like, let's stop hiding behind our mental health and let's start talking about it. So what this is, is a bursary for people to say, hey, listen, I'm at school despite my terrible history and I'm doing okay. And doing okay means, hey, you're passing. Good for you. And you're going to school. So that's all that's required. So that's how much of a partner I am. So with that, I want to start my presentation. I wanted to give you a little bit of background about who we are and why Algonquin is so important to me. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. We're going to attempt to share my screen. You figure 18 months later, I should know how to do this by now, but anyway. Okay, here we go. I believe you guys can all see that now. All right, so that's who I am. That's Mark Barnes. It's back uh, during COVID picture. Because, you know, that's, don't worry, the photographer was six feet away. We're good. All right. So here's our new head office. Sarah, I promised you I'd show you. This there is you our, go. I'm pumped. There's our new, new head office at 45 Montreal Road in Vanier, Ottawa. And the reason why I show this picture often is to show you that we're not just alone. We're not just a pharmacy who does the addiction treatment. And you can't do it as just a pharmacy. We have all kinds of community partners we work with right here in our buildings. Uh, the most wonderful organization that we work alongside with is Recovery Care. That is a brick and mortar addiction treatment center. Physicians, they have like 15 physicians over five locations in, in Ottawa, and they always co-locate with us. So if you actually require addiction treatment and you're struggling or even think you're struggling, you know what? You can walk into a recovery care at any of our locations, Monday to Friday, 8 to 4, and actually you can see a doctor, no appointment necessary, no referral necessary. And that's important to note. But not only that, we, we, we knew that, you know, doctor's office on one side, pharmacist on the other, it's still not enough to treat addiction and complex mental health. We needed to do more. So we want to focus on a holistic approach. So really wrap around services for people who are battling addiction, which means maybe it's clothing, maybe it's free vitamins, maybe it's rides to treatment, maybe it's a brand new outreach van that we're gonna to do to go to low income housing. 
Okay. And that's what we did through our nonprofit organization that we developed this year called Pathways to Recovery. So we're very excited about that as well. So this here is what funds these free seminars for Algonquin College, as an example, right? That's an example of some of the things that we do in our community to support everyone. So that's who we are as an organization. But enough about us. Who cares? Let's really talk about why we're here. Okay. We are here to talk about opioids and the opioid crisis. And like, I want to just back up and I'm going to pretend that you guys do not know anything about opioids. And I know on this call today, I'm talking to future um, students in our school of public safety, it's like fire, paramedic, and police foundations. I know I'm talking to future social workers and child and youth development, justice workers. I know that these programs exist at Algonquin College, but also not only that, the trades, all these professions need to know about this opioid crisis because you're going to see it in your lifetime. We'll talk about that. So what are they? What are opioids? Okay, so opioids are painkillers. And as a pharmacist, I can't sit here and say, hey, they're terrible medications because they're not. We cannot do modern medicine without opioids. Okay, and that's important to note. But where they should be reserved, advanced cancer pain and to put you to sleep for surgery. Okay, even as simple as putting you to sleep for wisdom teeth extraction. They require opioids. But keep that in the back of your mind as we think about opioid overdose. Now, common names. Hydromorphone, also known as dillies or dilly pops on the street. Morphine, codeine, oxycontin, um, Percocets, they're all opioids. Also, I got to mention lean. Lean is becoming very, very popular in Eastern Ontario. So lean is codeine cough syrup or hyconine cough syrup, two powerful cough suppressant opioid liquids mixed with vodka or rum and fruit juice. Okay, market it to kids as just an alcoholic beverage. And it is not, it is an opioid. So there's lots of kids now, even my 15 year old daughter told me she said a party the other day in Laird County. So I'm gonna out myself in Carlton Place, a prom party. And there's actually lean everywhere. Uh, these are opioids, okay? So they can kill you, kill you fast, especially in combination with um, alcohol. So this is very popular in Eastern Ontario. So much so that we're starting to see fake prescriptions come across our counters for this Hycodan and coating cough syrup. People trying to get lean. It's actually quite, quite common now. Now, let's go back 10, 12 years ago and think about every gangster movie you ever watched on TV. The most famous street sourced opioid of all time is heroin. Heroin is an opioid. Two street names are Down or H-Train, okay? Now, 10 years ago, yeah, lots of it around. Now, almost zero. Now, people say, hey, I'm on heroin. I use heroin, purple heroin, brown heroin, gold heroin but it is not heroin. It is now street sourced fentanyl. So not just like the fentanyl patches I talked about or the fentanyl we use to sedate you not in operating rooms, but it's also a street source fentanyl made in crack houses right across our country, especially Eastern Ontario. And that's the fentanyl I'm talking about. Now let's talk about this down, this source of down. So this is the new heroin, okay? Fentanyl is 100 times stronger than heroin. We measure fentanyl in micrograms, okay? So we can't even measure it in milligrams like heroin. It's micrograms, okay? Same drug we use to put you to sleep in surgery. Now, COVID-19 has changed the game. Inability to travel, cross borders, get raw ingredients if we could. I can't even order naloxone cases from China, for goodness sakes. It's hard to get stuff right now. I've ordered a truck, full disclosure, and I'm going to sit and wait for like another 14 years before I get my truck, apparently. So anyway, this is to say, this is the truth. Okay, you can't get crap. We can't get stuff anywhere. So this is what's happening. We have to be patient. But guess what? When there's an opioid crisis, no one's patient. So they started making all these new analogs of fentanyl. All kinds of stuff we've never seen before. Now there's like 100 different kinds of analogs of fentanyl across our streets right now. Some of them 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So now things like carfentanyl. Are out there, which we use to sedate elephants in Africa for surgery. Okay. Carfentanyl is 100 times stronger than fentanyl. So now really in 10 years, Ottawa and Eastern Ontario and most large urban centers in Canada, their toxic drug supply is now 10,000 times stronger than heroin per milligram strength. Absolutely terrifying because not only do we have an opioid crisis where people really want to use opioids, we also have a non-drug use opioid crisis where we're finding these opioids in all of the street drugs. Crystal meth, crack, cocaine, molly, ecstasy, street source marijuana, fake anabolic steroids, speed, you name it, we're finding it in it. It's, it's, it's insane. So much so that Ottawa Public Health 
and you guys will all get these cards too in the mail. Put out these cards. Anything can be cut with fentanyl and carfentanyl because we're finding these drugs in all other street drugs. So much so that it's not even just, we need to put this in all populations. I've got these cards translated in Arabic and Somali and French. And we're looking at other languages right now. It is insane. Every single population in Ottawa needs to know this information. We're finding these drugs everywhere. It is, it is devastating. Now, what actually is an acute opioid overdose? What is happening to your body out there on the street? We know we can't, we have, we can't trust any street drugs. We have to be careful. So I mentioned what we use opioids for in medicine. We use them to put you to sleep for surgery. Let's think about that process. You're into a pre-op room and the doctor says, hey, count backwards from 10, 9, 8, 7. Now you're unconscious, ready for surgery. At that point, the doctor will actually intubate and ventilate. They'll hook you up to a ventilator because you can't breathe during surgery. Because the opioids not only kill pain and sedate you for surgery, they also stop your breathing. So on the street, the street are also opioids, overdose is the exact same thing. Your breathing stops. So what is an opioid overdose? The mu receptors in the brain and spinal cord become saturated with the opioid. Breathing's depressed, your brain becomes hypoxic and you die. From the time you get access to the drug to the time you die, can be right now as quick as three to five minutes. Most people die on the street in an acute overdose situation uh, with actually 911's been called, paramedics are en route, but they still die before help can get there. Now, how bad is the problem? Actually, it is absolutely devastating. In Canada in 2020, we lost 6,214 people to an opioid overdose. It is representing now of one person. Okay, the number and rate per 100,000 of total parent opioid deaths. Okay, so 6214. That's the largest number we've ever seen. It represents one death every one hour and 24 minutes. Someone is losing uh, a life to an opioid overdose. And unfortunately, this province in Ontario is the epicenter. We lost 2,426 people to an opioid overdose in 2020. The biggest year we had ever seen, ever seen, was 2018, where we lost 4460. Since 2016, we lost over 21,000 Canadians. And the age is starting to get younger. You can tell that three quarters are male, 96% of them were actually related to accidental. Okay, and this is, this is terrifying. A little closer to home, we're no better, right? We talked about Ontario. In 2020, we lost 2,426 people. It represents a 60% increase over 2019. It is absolutely terrifying. In December alone, we lost 250 people last year, which is actually the highest month ever. There's a couple of things on this slide I want to point out. First, you'll see a sharp curve, increasing curve in 2016, 17, 18. That's the introduction of street source fentanyl to the streets of Ontario. Then we have a flattening of the curve in 2018, 2019. Remember that. And then a sharp, sharp increase in 2020 due to COVID-19. Fear, anxiety, isolation, and access to cash and CERB has led to more overdoses this past calendar year than we've ever seen. Terrifying. No public health unit actually in our province was exempt. Here in Ottawa, it actually was a 96% increase year over year. Now, we can't just say, okay, 2020 is over, it's done now. It hasn't stopped. This is a, a warning as of just a month ago at the long weekend in August in Toronto. There were over 200 opioid related overdose calls for Toronto paramedics. That is the biggest ever in two day history since they started monitoring it in 2017. And in Sudbury in June, this THC gold stuff started hitting the streets. And everyone thought it was just marijuana, street source of cannabis, THC. But it wasn't. It was cross-contaminated with carfentanil. People died. Well, I did mention we did some work in 2019 where we flattened the curve. Now, how in the hell did we do that? We flattened the curve by distributing overdose prevention naloxone kits to everyone and talking about it. Programs like this at Algonquin were very popular at that time. We were out and about doing all kinds of things. Me and Sarah were down in the commons by the Starbucks there, giving them the loss of kids every four days, I swear. 
we wanted to make a difference and it started to work. We started to flatten the curve right across this province and even just started to tread water with the opioid overdose crisis. As you can see from this slide, Ottawa had the highest kit distribution at 38.1 kits per opioid harm. Awesome. We smoked the Ontario average and we're killing Toronto. We were doing way better. More kits per harm out there. We were getting kits out there. However, when I talked to our coroner's office about this, they said, hey, Mark, at that point, you're only putting kits out one in every four deaths. So if we were the best in the province and we were only batting 25% of the time, we need to put more kits out there. More people need to be aware is why I'm so thankful you guys are all here today. Now, who is at risk of opioid poisoning? Among our friends and family in our community, who is really at risk? Medical literature textbooks will tell you we got to focus on these three boxes. Box one, patients prescribed opioids. Well, that makes a hell of a lot of sense, right? Patients prescribed opioids. Yeah, okay, I can get that. I can get that. Because opioids cause death. Let's face it. Every opioid prescription should be dispensed with a, an naloxone kit, and they're not. It's terrible. Pharmacists are doing a terrible job. So that's great. We should talk about that. That's important. And the friends and family of those people also should be careful. That makes sense because people share opioids, actually. And, you know, really, they're given stolen. Over 70% of people use opioids for non-medical reasons. And we see a lot of this in our construction sector. One in three overdoses of employed individuals in Ontario are in their construction sector. So all you trade students out there, think about that. If you be working in HVAC, uh, construction, carpentry, uh, millwright, electrical, uh, whatever, you are going to see that your brethren are actually at high risk of opioid overdose. And then also our substance misuse patients. This is like an open book test, right? People are saying I have a problem, so they may actually have an overdose again. Now, what we have to know is that we cannot just focus on those three boxes because of a rich, young, white female, which is full of stigma, that's why I said it, because that's the lowest person represented, rolls out of the mansion in Canada, pops a Molly tablet with her, with her friends down by the river on Friday night, because that's what she does every three weeks. And she, that Molly is cross-contaminated with carfentanil and she drops dead. She wasn't represented here in those three, three boxes. So we cannot just focus on medical literature. We really have to have a street perspective about opioid use. First of all, we dispense more naloxone prescription or more opioid prescriptions in Ontario than almost anywhere else on the planet. Hundreds of millions of opioid prescriptions for only 20, 26 million people. Almost three or four uh, opioid prescriptions per person on average. So we know there's a lot of opiates in the streets, but also there's a lot of cross contaminated our street drugs too. So really we need to think about tolerance and look at our street perspective. I always divide these in patient factors and drug factors. If someone does not have tolerance to the opioid, they're at risk of overdose. So what is tolerance, right? Tolerance is that you get used to the drug after you take it for a while. If you have not seen an opioid in three days or you have never seen an opioid in your body, you have no tolerance. So if a grandmother makes a mistake with her own prescription because of dementia, doesn't take it for a few days, then takes too many to go to bingo on Thursday, she will overdose and die. I heard a story two weeks ago from a professor at Ottawa University who told me they just lost their nine-month-old niece to an opiate overdose because she crawled across the floor, got access to a tablet, and overdosed. There was no naloxone in that house. Tragic. Not that one overdose is more tragic than the other, but when it's a child who's so innocent, it is preventable. Also, if you thought you were doing Molly, like that girl in Canada, but it was carfentanil, you will die because you're not used to seeing the opioid. Post-incarceration, people who've been in custody for three days have no tolerance. They've lost it in jail. They're at high risk of overdose post-incarceration. We're seeing that during COVID with a 55% increase. This is important to note. Also, if you are not well, you have other medical problems, you have breathing difficulties like COVID-19, you're on complex medication and regimes that affect your kidney and liver function, you're at more risk of overdose. And if you use alone because you don't want to talk about your drug use, you're a student and you're embarrassed that you use cocaine and speed to help you study. And it's cross-contaminated, you will die because you use alone in your dorm room. My message is, do not use alone, carry naloxone. Using alone has been a big problem during COVID-19. We've asked people to self-isolate. 
And then previous overdoses of any substance is a risk factor for future overdoses. Now, why is that? Well, right now, if there's anything you take from this lecture, I want you to take this piece of information with you. Previous overdoses are a risk factor for future overdoses because that really defines what opioid, over, uh, opioid use disorder is. First and foremost, people who use opioids chronically, okay? So opioid use disorder is not a character flaw. It is not a moral insufficiency. And addiction and mental health really isn't in general, but especially among opioid use disorder. People use opioids to kill pain. Absolutely, they are painkillers. But the pain that they use, the pain that they're trying to kill is not just physical pain. The pain is often mental pain. Of all drugs out there, street drugs, prescription drugs, whatever, the best drug at turning off the brain from trauma are opioids. People here describe the hit of the opioid in three main terms, liquid caramel, a warm blanket, but more often than not, the term used to describe how the opioid makes someone feel mentally is a warm hug. That's powerful. That is powerful. Powerful literature to describe how the opioid makes them feel. That's what I'm battling every day, that addiction. And who doesn't want a hug? especially during COVID-19. The problem is the opioids they use to kill their pain. So if you've had post-traumatic stress disorder from military service, abandonment, and all the struggles in our indigenous communities, childhood sexual assaults, uh, our military service, think about the trauma people have been through in their lives. Who doesn't want to hug to, to forget that stuff? The problem is where they feel the hug and their flashbacks are gone is about two breaths per minute. They're almost dead. And people who use opioids probably use them five times a day to get them through their day of not to feel a flashback. Thus, with the new toxic drug supply on our streets that we cannot control, people slip into overdose all the time. So a previous overdose is a risk factor for future ones. They will overdose again and again and again until they get well, which may take many, many, many years. And remember, the drugs are stronger than ever. This slide depicts how strong they are. That's a one inch ruler on the right hand side, three vials on the left. This is known as LD50, lethal dose 50% of the time. So if we all took that much heroin, half of us would die. That much fentanyl, half of us would die. Same thing for that carfentanil. Fentanyl and carfentanil are on the streets of Ontario. That carfentanil vial there is the size of a few grains of salt that can get cross contaminated mixed in any other street drug. This is why we're having a problem. Now, what are the signs and symptoms of opioid overdose? How can you identify them quickly if you're out and about, in your community, at your job, whatever? Everyone's going to get these cards, as I mentioned. On the back of the card is all the signs and symptoms of opioid overdose. So I'll go over all of them and then go over the ones we see more often. The first one is decreased level of consciousness. That makes sense. You are ready for surgery. You are completely unconscious. You've got a pinch to shake this guy. They will not wake up otherwise. You can do a knee replacement on them. They won't wake up. Okay? That is opioid overdose. The next symptom is pinpoint pupils. So the pupil is the black part of your eye, almost becomes non-existent. All you can see is the color part. Bright blue and green eyes, very distinctive. Then we see a deep snorting and gurgling sound. This is the body gasping for air without the mechanical ability to breathe. Um, the same sound you'd make if I took my hands, placed them around your neck and choked you out. The lips turn blue, then the fingertips turn blue, then the whole hands turn blue, the whole face turns blue. Blue is a great color, defined by medical literature for white guys, but we are a multicultural, diversified ethnicity society, very diverse. So really this color blue is bull, okay? It's blue or gray. If you're a dark complexion, Middle Eastern descent, indigenous, black, it is actually gray. It is not blue lips. It's gray face, gray lips, hands turn gray. So it should be blue or gray. Vomiting then happens, but it's not vomiting. It's actually foaming at the mouth, a white cottage cheese foam that comes out of the mouth, and then um, shaking, a neurologic response known as the funky chicken. These are all your signs and symptoms. Now, I've trained well, well over, I guess it's got to be close to 60,000 people now how to, how to use an naloxone kit. And for every 25 kits I put in the community, one is used. So here's the feedback I get. I ask someone, 
hey, you helped out last night in an overdose. Congratulations. What did you see? They're like pinpoint pupils, gurgling, blue gray lips and shaking. That's what they talk about all the time. That's what you need to know. Now, you're halfway through. We've talked about the crisis, how bad it is. We talked about why people take opioids. Now you know the signs and symptoms. What the hell are we going to do about it? We are going to use Narcan nasal spray. These are free overdose prevention kits that I can give you, that Naloxone Care Respector X can give you. And we are probably the largest distributor of Naloxone overdose kits in Canada. Definitely now with our program with St. John Ambulance. We actually give out more kits than almost everybody, which is really amazing because I like to save lives. That's my goal here. And you guys can too with Narcan nasal spray. Three overdose prevention kits covered by the Minister of Health for you guys here in Ontario. The brand name is Narcan. Okay, you got to think of this stuff here as the EpiPen for opioids, except it's not an injection, it's just a nasal spray. It's single dose nasal spray, already primed, ready to rock and roll. Okay, one dose per device. Now, like an EpiPen doesn't remove pants from the body, this does not remove opioids from the body. What it does goes into the brain stem, the breathing centers in the lung, opens up and takes the opioid off the, the receptors, allowing the body to breathe for a short time until paramedics get there. I mentioned that most people die with paramedics en route, not with this stuff. This keeps them breathing until paramedics get there. It's awesome. It only takes two to four minutes to start working and the person doesn't even have to be breathing for it to work. Now, a lot of people are, are like, you know, Mark, I'm afraid to use it because you told me that's a warm hug. Am I gonna take your hug away? Really, then remember, they haven't taken just enough dose, they took an overdose, right? So the chance of them going in acute withdrawal is actually quite small, quite small now. More and more as time goes on. Will they wake up anxious and agitated? Probably, because they just freaked out because they didn't really expect the overdose. Three quarters of people who have overdosed in the past don't think they'll overdose again, though they do, right? So, I mean, people just are surprised that they do it. So they wake up kind of freaking out. And it doesn't last that long, remember, even if you cause withdrawal, the drug itself, which is Narcan nasal spray, only lasts about 20 to 40 minutes. That is it. Actually, really 15 to 20 now. We're seeing the drug stronger than ever. The person will slip back into overdose. You must call 911. It's a medical emergency. And do not worry about calling 911. Nobody gets in trouble. Why? Narcan is the safest thing I can give out in the day as a pharmacist. It causes no harm. Even if you're wrong and that shaking was a seizure, you've done no harm. It only works in opiate overdose. I can Narcan myself right now and nothing would happen. It only works if you're using opioids. That is it. It's completely safe. And our Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act supports it. It says two main things. One, nobody's in trouble for using Narcan in the event of an opiate overdose, even if they were wrong. Two, if you're using opioids yourself, you're not in trouble. There's never been a paramedic called to testify in a drug trial in Ontario's history. And even if you've been recently released from prison with conditions that say, hey, stay away from opioids, you're not going to get pinched on that. Okay, the Good, the good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act protects us. This stuff is completely safe. You must call 911. It's a medical emergency. No one gets in trouble. Kids have to know that. Now, how do we use this stuff? I'd love to be there in front of you guys showing you how to use this, but I can't right now. So what I'm going to do is bring you to my website, naloxonecare.com, and show you our training video. It's a four-minute training video, and before you give me criticism about the video, I apologize. Brad Pitt was not available. It's just me in a red shirt. I'm going to show you the video, uh, and we'll reconvene after uh, to talk about it again. So I'll share my screen, um, this time optimized for video clips, bring you to the website, and show you the training video. In 2018, one Canadian died every two hours from an opiate overdose, and this number continues to rise. It's not just heroin or fentanyl users in the streets, it's grandmothers with their own prescriptions, and kids who didn't even know they took an opioid. My name is Mark Barnes, I'm a pharmacist and the owner of NaloxoneCare.com, an interactive website designed to allow more Canadians to access life-saving drug Naloxone. Naloxone is the drug that's found in an easy to use Narcan nasal spray. It can reverse the effects of an opiate overdose in as quick as two to three minutes. After you complete a simple training and answer a few questions on this website, we can send you a Narcan nasal spray kit directly to your home.
So what are opioids? They are painkillers such as codeine, morphine, oxycontin, percocet, and fentanyl. Recently, much stronger powdered fentanyl and carfentanyl are leading to accidental use and overdose because they are so small and hard to detect if mixed with other drugs. With this Narcan nasal spray antidote, you can deliver two milligrams of naloxone directly to the bloodstream. Although naloxone can reverse the effect of an opioid overdose, it cannot remove the opioids from the body. It's important to call 911 after you administer the spray because in 20 to 40 minutes, the effects of naloxone will wear off and the person will slip back into overdose. The time it takes when an opioid is ingested to overdosing and death can be as quick as three to five minutes, which is why it's so important to recognize the symptoms quickly. Here are the four major symptoms of an overdose. Unconsciousness, the person is not moving and cannot be woken up even if you shake or pinch them. Pinpoint pupils, the person's pupils are small and hard to detect. Snorting or gurgling sounds, the person can be heard gurgling or choking and breathing is shallow or undetectable. Blue and gray lips, the person's lips turns blue or gray. Other symptoms include cold, clammy skin, foaming at the mouth, and shaking. Every naloxone kit you order from naloxonecare.com includes a case, latex-free vinyl gloves, a CPR mask, two doses of Narcan nasal spray, an identification card letting everyone know that you've been trained to use naloxone, and instructions. We like the five-step approach to respond to an opiate overdose. Step one, shake and shout. Assess the person and remember the major symptoms of an overdose. Step two, call 911. If the person is unresponsive, call 911 right away. Step three, administer the naloxone. Lay the person on their back. Remove the device from the packaging. There's only one dose per device, which is ready to use. So do not test or prime the device. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under their neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into the nostril. Your fingers should be right up against the nose. If giving to a child, make sure the nozzle seals the nostril. Press the plunger firmly with your thumb to give the dose. Remove the device in the nostril. Step four, chest compressions. Start CPR as it takes two to three minutes for naloxone to start working. If you have an AED, use it. If not, push on the center of the chest. This pushes any of the oxygen left in the body to the brain and circulates naloxone to the areas of the brain and lung to start working. Step five, is it working? If you do not hear a deep breath in two to three minutes, then go back to step three and administer a second dose of Narcan nasal spray found in your kit. Once the naloxone is actively working and the person is breathing on their own, put them in the recovery position. The recovery position helps open the person's airways and avoids choking on vomit or spit. Remember, naloxone only lasts 20 to 40 minutes, so an overdose can return. It's important to get the proper medical treatment. Tell paramedics everything you know about the situation so they can provide the best care. Get trained, get a kit, save a life. All right, so that there is the training video. So now I can already be convinced actually to change my training. Um, though I can't yet, because the Ministry of Health says, hey, Mark, you have to do five-step approach for now. It's okay. But I am seeing the consequences of people who've used Narcan nasal spray and didn't die. So it worked, but yet I'm still seeing the full-time consequences of opioid overdose where the lack of oxygen in the brain has caused permanent medical damage, right? So when we study this stuff, we study mortality and morbidity data, which means that they make it, that they not make it, right? I prefer to think that we need to get naloxone in the body as fast as possible because every second counts because there's still permanent brain damage. Okay. So step one, you do your assessment quickly. Pinpoint people's gurgling, blue gray lips shaking. Okay. You've done your assessment. You're telling somebody else to call 911 or you're putting 911 on speakerphone as you're giving naloxone right away. You take it out of the package quickly. Okay. That's how it works. Now there's a two side piece. You'll on to and a plunger in the middle. You take it, you place it in the nose and you spray Left nostril, you twist towards left eye. Right nostril, twist a little bit towards the right eye and put in your sinuses behind your eye and you spray it. Bam. When you spray it, you've done what you can do. It's been punctured. It's been used. You puncture the canister in here, guys. I'll show you. It's already been used. Single use. The plunger's gone. You've administered it. Now it takes two to four minutes for this to start working. How we make it work faster at this point is by using an AED or just starting chest compressions. During COVID-19, Public Health Ontario says no, no uh, rescue breathing. 
just do chest compressions. You push on the chest for a solid two minutes. Now, if it works, you'll hear this. <gasps> if it doesn't work, you need to get more naloxone. So you grab a second spray that's in your kit. You put in the other nostril and you spray again. So it goes naloxone, chest compressions for two minutes, naloxone, chest compressions for two minutes, naloxone, chest compressions for two minutes, naloxone, chest compressions for two minutes. You keep going until you run out of naloxone. And most people get two kits from me, which is four sprays, or a paramedic tells you to stop. Now, the last step that's not on my video here is step number six, your own personal mental health. You've been through something traumatic. Someone almost died in front of you. Take care of yourself. Whatever that means you need to do, take care of it. If it's spiritual healing, then do it. If you require sports and activity, friends, whatever you need to make yourself well, take care of your own mental health. If there's anything that COVID-19 has taught us as health professionals is that people don't take care, take care of themselves enough. And that's so, so important. Now I'm gonna share my screen again, just to bring you to one more slide. Mark, we do have a couple questions. Yeah, just one second. I'm just gonna finish this and we'll get right to questions, sir. Okay, perfect. Bossy pants. Okay, getting the locks on. Now, you guys are all getting the locks mail to you because you guys are all gone from college, you're my partners and I love you. Okay, so you're all getting naloxone FedEx directly to you. So don't go getting creeped out when some guy named Mark Byrne sends you a weird package in the mail. Okay, it's me sending you naloxone. Okay, and some resources as well. But also for your friends and family, they can go to that website that's on the page right now to find out where you can get free naloxone in Ontario. Uh, be patient with pharmacy. Some pharmacists have no idea what they're doing, actually, and it's frustrating. Or they'll ask you weird questions about opiate use when, you know, whatever. So if an easy way to do this is just email me directly to mbarnes at respectdirects.ca or go to naloxonecare.com, get a kit and get trained. On the website itself, this is what it looks like. You follow the, the prompts to order a naloxone kit to get your kit and I'll mail it to you in the mail. And those of you that identify as indigenous status, uh, I can actually mail naloxone to you, your family, anywhere in Canada. So please register with your NIHB number or your FNHA number. It is completely confidential, no one sees it and you could actually then get a kit mailed to you anywhere in Canada. That is it. The last thing I always say before I take questions is ask not why the addiction, but why the pain. All right, I'll stop my share. Now, questions, Sarah. Okay, so we have a few. Okay. Um, folks, remember first before we ask, uh, get the questions from Mark, I have sent the form there. Please fill out that form to get your naloxone kit. Um, we will send them to you. So, and also person who said, sorry for asking another question, please ask 500 if you want. That's yeah, why exactly. we're here. Exactly. Um, okay. You want to get a hold the of me person... My email's there as well, so. Yeah, perfect. People are saying, thank you. It was great. So one of the first question we have is uh, with opioids and complex mental health issues being closely intertwined, what are your thoughts on opioid use as treatment and monotherapy for refractory depression or an augmenting agent when adding to other meds? Hell no. Because opioids are super dangerous. But you know what? I know what you're thinking. Because really, it's a triangle we treat. And you're right. So first of all, all of our treatment is patient-centered. So I like to do this on the thing with my hand. Right? I think Taylor Swift does this. I do this. Okay, this is what this is, okay? It's a triangle. Pain, mental health, and addiction. You never treat one. You treat them all together. But unfortunately, what we're trying to do is stop opioid use because what all, all substances do that turn off the brain is delay the problem. It's the intense cognitive behavioral therapy, medications, dealing with what caused the opioid use that takes so long to fix, 10, 15 years. That's the hard work. But then you have kind of, unfortunately, have to get a new life, which means work on your past relationships, your financial issues, answer the bell with crime, talk about housing, your other infections. It's just a disaster if you go down the opioid train as treatment. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, why you would want to use it, especially for refractory depression that's not working. But unfortunately, it doesn't solve the problem. It just delays the problem. So that is why opioids are an escape from reality and the, the mental health you're feeling, not a treatment solution. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. If folks have more questions or follow-ups, you can post them in. Um, the person asked, do we alternate nostrils if the second dose is required or use the same one? The answer is if you remember, right? So first of all, I had a little young scout guy, a young uh, boy scout, bring him through the treatment center as a tour and they really wanted to see a treatment center. And I made a guy pee in a cup and stuff. That was really cool. Um, needless to say, uh, when we did that little tour, a little fella when I was doing my training, the guy in the front row was, his eyes were just locked on me the whole time. 
And he was talking about, like, I could tell he's going to go home and he's using his hands to kind of see how he's going to do it. I knew for a fact this 11 and 12 year old is going to use this when he goes home with mom and dad. And he said, you know what? You know, excuse me, sir. Um, I'm like, don't call me, sir. That's my dad. And then I said to them, I said, listen, he said, like, I'm not going to remember what nostril I used. I'm going to be very nervous. Can I leave the spray in there so I remember which nostril I used? I'm like, absolutely. Right. There's a guy who's thinking about what he's going to do. So there's an example for you. And the guy may wake up with two things in his nose, whatever. He's got adequate pain management on board. He's not going to feel a thing. Okay. Remember that. So it's no problem whatsoever. And, but yeah, you're supposed to switch nostrils because the first nostril didn't work, which we want to make sure there's no structural issue. And we don't even have the data on structural issues. So before you ask that question, those is a broken nose or deviated septum matter. We don't know the answer. So that's the question. I've already asked that question to medical information at Emergent Biosolutions. I haven't got the response yet, but needless to say, one spray, then the other spray, if you remember. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so another question is, is it only nasal or intramuscular still being used? Both are being used. However, in the general population, why in the hell would you use an injection? Because you use an injection kit. Here's an injection kit. Okay. So I have to, first things first, here's what the injections look like. They're a little so We like should that. start the timer at this point and remember how long it takes for an overdose I know. death. So you have to you have to crack an ampule, then you have to take an alcohol swab, swab the area, take a syringe, get inside that glass with a cut in your hand, drop all the liquid, remove all the liquid out of the syringe, allow the alcohol to dry in the arm, and then inject it into a muscle. The guy's dead. The guy's dead before you do it. I actually was with the health minister, Jane Philpott, when she was the health minister in Canada, uh, down in Parliament Hill. We had two dummies down there. And I'm not talking about our caucus members. So there was, there was two dummies down there. That's my dad joke for the day. There was two dummies sitting there. And there was uh, an ampule. And I had a nasal spray. And we had a race. And she's a doctor. We had a race about who could administer naloxone faster. Burns he won every time. Because you can't do it as fast. And it was my way of trying to tell them that they should be funding this stuff nationally. Because it just saves lives. Now. That being said, I get it. There's four milligrams in this spray and only 0.4 milligrams in an injection. So if you want to remove the hug slowly, that's why injection is still being used, right? But really, I don't want that. I really want people using nasal spray now. The average dose of naloxone used to reverse an overdose right now in Canada, I think is like 2.6 milligrams. There's only two milligrams in this. You may need more than one spray. Yeah, I think that's another question that a lot of folks ask is like, how many sprays will we need? And it's as many as it takes for the person to wake up. I've got a new record. 40. I've seen 40 sprays being used. Yep. And I then went to emergency biosolutions again saying, how much can we absorb in what time frame? And they're like, thanks for your question, Mark. We don't know. <laughs> so, but it worked. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, God, I can't stand this. But anyway. It's wild. Okay. Someone else was, would it better would not be better to risk COVID than losing the person's life? Yeah. Well, first of all, if someone inside your immediate bubble that you like already made out with or something, like obviously you're going to do a rescue breathing, right? Like face it. Come on here. Now I know uh, if you want, you know, Sarah's your sexual health person. Like, I'm just going to say in general. Okay. <laughs> the idea here is yes, there is CPR barriers in everybody's kits as well. I'll show you. Everybody's kit comes with a CPR barrier. That being said, this is public health recommendations about trying to stop, stop, you know, a pandemic, right? And we're trying to fight this epidemic in the face of a pandemic. So it's brutal. Someone's inside your bubble or a loved one, or if you're fully vaccinated, feel comfortable for the love of God, do rescue breathing. Absolutely. Right. Maybe even give two breaths first. I don't know. But these CPR barriers are in everybody's cases. That being said, this is why, is this a paramedic student asked this question? They should be. Anyway, needless to say, that's why we're saying this. And really, Remember, the breathing centers are kind of shut off. So the ability of the body to absorb oxygen at this point until you get naloxone in there is pretty limited anyway. This is why naloxone piece is so important for an opioid overdose. The problem is, as an untrained medical professional, we don't know if it's an opioid overdose potentially. So this is why breathing is so important if it's a heart attack or something else. So we're kind of, you know, the, our five-step approach is what we use here. Rescue breathing is not recommended during COVID-19. That being said, if there's a loved one on probably it's doing normal CPR. Okay, perfect. Another question. Uh, I get that policies and practices are always in place, but why are we worried about cleaning an injection spot or getting a flu, et cetera, if the alternate is death? You got it. That's right. You're completely right. I'm just telling you how I'm supposed to train you. Silly. 
but I don't care if you jab it in their neck if you have to, right? I mean, yeah, that's an extreme measure. But we had one guy before, when I used to, first of all, nasal wasn't always covered. It was only uh, by our public health uh, authority. It was only injection. So when I was training people how to use injection, someone told me, hey, Mark, a guy passed out. So he fell off the couch behind the couch. We couldn't get at him. All we could get at was his forearm. <laughs> so his forearm came out on the other side of the couch. And I said, we gave him Narcan in his forearm. Is that cool? I'm like, yep. <laughs> Like, you know, you do what you do, right? Like in an emergency situation, you do what you do. And first of all, you're going to make mistakes anyway. You know why? Because you're freaking out. It's normal. That's completely normal. You're going to make mistakes, but you do the best you can. All I'm saying is get an on the body and push on the chest for the love of God. Call 911. Yeah. And th that's an important part, folks, is don't forget to call 911. Like, oh, my God. First, they get called. Yeah. You know, and on campus, there's actually quick response people. Every single Algonquin College security team has naloxone. And naloxone you guys are naloxone the deaf over there. It's great. Yeah, we are. It's I just, well, Mark just refreshed all of ours because we yeah. didn't, and we're not expired. That gonna talk, not that I'm going to talk about other institutions because I love Algonquin, but I got to show you something because I love you guys. Oh no, is are we is there something we could be doing better? Look at this here. This is Carlton University's okay, box on box. Wait. Sorry, I I wait, leave it up. I accidentally uh oh, where's that? Carlton University here in Ottawa. Ooh, ah. What did, did you make them that? I can't make them that. They can order them from a Nalox box. It's an actually a company, but I can send you the link. Please. Thank you, friend. No problem. We Those actually have them, yeah, we actually have them uh, cheaper ones because we're cheap. But no, I'm just kidding. We have we actually have them in Ottawa some Ottawa uh, public uh, housing buildings. I'm gonna try to find one. So uh, it's like an AED box, but for yeah, I've actually even just had you know those first aid box you strap on the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a locks on those and say the yeah. locks on inside. Like you know, start thinking about this your residents, people, or whatever. So we actually have. Well, we have oh, them in all our duty bags and stuff. So whenever the RAs are going out, they've right. got the and the RAs are the ones that should be trained. But I was kind of trying to hopefully I was going to show you, um, I can show my basement renovation, my kids. I can't find a picture right now. Anyway, I'm trying. I was going to try to phone, uh, show you guys the picture of uh, another uh, modified box thing we we thought of uh, in a hallway, right? And that we actually have uh, Respect RX monitor it, and it's really saved a lot of lives at a community housing project around town. So it's great. We have to think outside the box, pardon the pun. Okay. Yeah. I know I'm such a nerd. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, one more question. Uh, uh, sorry, it says, and if we don't, what happens if someone finds out, but I don't know what they're referring to. Right. And anyway, listen, here's the other thing I forgot to mention. This stuff here, the red plunger is important. I, the company changed it to match my video. No, they never. But the, the reason why the red plunger is important is that the red plunger lets you know that the stuff is stable, frozen, or thawed now until expiry date. Expires uh, is 36 months, so it's like March 2024. Really good. And stable, frozen, or thawed. So, yeah, you can leave it in your car because it's stable, oh. frozen, or thawed until expiry date now. And it doesn't freeze to minus 15. And it's stable okay. to plus 45. Once frozen, it unthaws in your hand in about 10 minutes at room temperature in about 15. So... Before you do your drugs, make sure your stuff's not frozen. But it's really cool for people who are marginally housed or homeless or people who live in climates. So they change zero. it from the white plunger. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea of the red plunger, man. It's new stuff. So why is it different? Because now it's stable for sure. Before we used to say it, we didn't know it. Now they know it for sure. And they got stability data down to minus 15 up to plus 45. Whoop, whoop. That's good stuff. Oh, for, oh, following proper procedure, is there potential for consequences if you don't? No, not really. I mean, you try to do the best you can, right? You want to get, basically get in the locks on there. Like, I'm like, I'm almost giving two sprays right away, too. Like, I'm like a cowboy. <laughs> like, I'm going crazy because I just know what works. But no, you do follow the process, like I told you, but there's no consequences. And plus, no matter what you try, the Good Samaritan Act protects you against any litigation. You're golden. Mm-hmm which is good. Yeah. Okay. So folks, if make sure that you filled out the form that I sent. Yeah. Um, we will Lots send kids to your house. This is great. Great conversation guys. Is there anything else that anyone wants to know before we finish up? I'll hold for just another couple minutes, but. All right. This has been great.
And this won't be the yeah. last one. This will not be the last one. I'm not no. Gonna... We'll and have actually, more. Guys, Tell you know, your friends. I'm actually, uh, if you are in a class, students, I motivate you. Speak to your professor about having me out. I'll come out for an hour long lecture, just like this one in, in with your class, virtually and, all, and then in person. It's no problem. I love helping you. There's a bunch of classes I already do in nursing schools and the school of public safety, uh, youth and uh, youth justice, uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So anyway, get a hold of your professor. Uh, and if you want a, a professional referral to who I am and some background, I can send my bio and stuff or Sarah can get it to you. Perfect. Okay. Thanks again, Mark. My we pleasure. always love having you. Um, people are just saying, thank you. That was great. No so, uh, yeah, perfect. So if anyone needs, uh, please reach out to us. We've got Project Lighthouse, uh, yeah. or sorry, the Umbrella Project. Project Lighthouse is our safer sex and consent. Uh, Umbrella Project is all about safer use of alcohol and other substances. So feel free to check out the website. And uh, if you need more, naloxonecare.com. Thanks again, right. Mark. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.